So my earliest memory is from some time when I was two or three years old. And my parents were carrying me into our house, and I looked down and I saw our cat. Now, what's remarkable to me about that memory is it's the first time that I can really recall putting a label on something. I saw this fluffy thing and I thought, cat. And obviously I had seen this animal before, and I'd seen pictures of it in books or on TV, but people had had to train me to recognize that word in connection with that object. And from that point on, hopefully, I went on to learn a lot more things. And I took in not only a lot more objects and the words associated with them, but I learned from the people around me, right? I lived in different homes, I had friends, I went to college, I went to law school, I did a postgraduate degree, I lived abroad in several different places. I read lots of books and watched movies and listened to music. All of these things combined together make me who I am as a person. It's the things I've taken in. There was one day that I was reading Neil Gaiman's The Wolves in the Wall to my children for the umpteenth time, and I suddenly had a story come to me. And I spent the next two years writing that story. And all those things that I had taken in historically in my past came out in this book in one way or another. I was influenced by those things I had learned and all of the other creative products that I had read or watched or brought in. I then hired um, an illustrator, uh, Ian Adams in Boston, to create illustrations to go with my book. And it was really amazing for me to watch him take my work and create his own version of it in an illustration. Obviously influenced by what I wrote, but also influenced by his past and the things he had learned and all of the creative works he had taken in. Now, we all know the idea that potentially with infinite monkeys at infinite typewriters and infinite time, someone else, that, that monkey, would be able to actually create the same work I created. But, but that seems improbable. That doesn't seem like something that could actually happen. But I do wonder if that's actually true. When we talk about artificial intelligence or algorithms, I think it's very hard for us as people to relate to what that really means. It's hard to us to, for us to think that those things that make us human can be replicated by machine creativity, for example, or originality. And we hear a lot of hype about AI. AI has been in development for several decades, but we're just now getting to the point where we're actually beginning to see implementation that works, and there's a ton of hype. You know, algorithms and AI are gonna take all jobs, and in the future, we'll all be slaves to computers. Now, AI is gonna take all jobs, and it will lead us to a life of luxury. We'll be able to just create works. We won't have to worry anymore. Well, neither one of those things is probable. But the truth is probably gonna be somewhere in the middle. There will be a lot of positive that comes from artificial intelligence, and there will also be a lot of negative. What is artificial intelligence? Well, at a very high level, it's exactly what it says. It is trying to replicate human intelligence from a computer. Now, AI is not one thing, though. AI is made up of a lot of different technologies. There's neural networks, there's machine learning, there's generative adversarial networks and um, a variety of other technologies that go into AI, and there will be even more as we go. So how do all of these things come together and how does this impact things like creativity and originality? Well, I wanna focus on one of the building blocks of AI in particular, which is machine learning. And what is machine learning? Again, it's exactly what it says. It is teaching a machine to learn what objects are, to put that that tag on them. So just like I learned what a cat is, because I saw this cat and people kept telling me, that's a cat. That's very much how machine learning works. You have engineers that create algorithms, and algorithms are really just a set of rules or a process, the instructions by which the computer is going to operate. And they introduce that algorithm to an image. Let's say it's of a cat, and that image is labeled, that's a cat. Then they will introduce another 5,000, 6,000 images of cats that are in different positions, different colors, different ages, and they say, this is cats. The algorithm will look at different points at all of those images, the ears, the whiskers, the tail, and it will get 
an idea that when they see these different points, it is likely a cat. So it's making a statistically accurate prediction that you're dealing with a cat. We will also introduce lots of images and say this is not a cat, it's a dog. And so the algorithm is able to start learning in this way. So that makes sense, right? So now let's go to the next step with AI, and that is creating algorithms that ask the computer to create an image of a cat. And I don't mean pull an image out of their database and show it to me. I mean actually create an original and unique image of a cat. And we do this as people. So before coming here, I asked my family to sit down and draw a picture of a cat without looking at anything, just from what they know in their minds. You have the ears, you have the whiskers, the tail. These are all different images, but there are those same elements that make us know this is a cat. Computers are no different. The algorithms are no different when we're asking them to create an original cat. Now, just like humans, sometimes they don't quite get it right, right? But they're getting much, much better at generating these images. And sometimes they're getting really eerily good. These are all computer-generated computer images of people. Now, I'm not here to talk about deep fakes or malicious use of AI, and I don't want to talk about how you can take false information and feed that in as data and create some sort of a, a new reality. These things are all true. But I want to talk actually about the question of bias and the, particularly a creativity bias. It's one thing when I say to a computer, create an image of a cat. That seems very neutral. But what happens when I say, create me an image of a beautiful cat? Somebody at some point, an individual, a person, has had to label cats as beautiful and instruct the computer that this is how we define beautiful. And how you might define beautiful may be very different from how I define beautiful. But that algorithm has been given that instruction that this is what beauty means, and here are images of beauty, and this is what you replicate on, this is what you iterate on. Look at this painting. This is an AI-generated painting. The signature on the painting is actually a part of the code that is used um, to create this. It's called The Portrait of Edmund Bellamy. What's interesting about this painting, I mean, it was created by a French art collective called Obvious, and they used a generative adversarial network. It's the algorithm to create this, and it's, it's part of machine learning. What's really interesting to this is they fed 15,000 paintings into this algorithm. And they covered various time frames, but obviously were related to European portraiture. And they asked this algorithm to create its own painting. So we're moving away from just that pure uh, example of a person or a cat to really creating a work that could be something like a Francis Bacon painting. The other interesting thing for me about this painting is that this past year it sold at auction for $400,000. And so not only are we seeing this technology work, we as a society are beginning to value it. We're beginning to put a monetary value around the output itself, just like we may pay for a painting that a, that a human artist has created. And as with anything, when we start putting money behind something, that's when things can get fairly complex. Since the 1700s, we have protected creative and original works through a variety of different legal uh, regulations. Copyright for one, patents which cover inventions and methods, but I'm gonna really focus on, on copyright for these purposes. And why have we introduced copyright? Well, a long time ago, it was very hard to be someone who created works and put them out there unless you were independently wealthy or unless you had a patron. And so if you really wanted to create works, you're dealing with a small microcosm of society putting that out there. In part, we create things like copyright because it enables two key things. And the first is what we call the public domain. We value an expansion of creative works that are introduced to society because it enables us to create more works. We build off of them, just like I built off of elements that I got from Neil Gaiman's book, or Philip Pullman, or a million other authors. 
And so we want to encourage works to be released into the public domain. And we do that by also allowing you to have a limited monopoly on that creative work. You can get compensation for that work and you can prevent other people from copying that exact work. And in return, the expectation is it goes in the public domain. Now it's been so successful that we have started extending the duration of copyright for a very long time. So companies can control copyright for over 100 years in most jurisdictions. And individuals, it's for the life of the artist plus 50 years after their death. And more and more, these creative works are driving economies. But there are things that we don't protect, and that's data, it's facts. I can draw or can make a painting of a cat, and I can prevent you from copying it, but I can't say that you cannot make your own painting of a cat. Similarly, you may create a telephone directory that includes people's names and the phone numbers associated with them, but you can't prevent other people from making their own phone directories. Those are facts, and we don't want to give permanent monopolies on facts. The other things that we don't protect, non-human created works. So a selfie uh, that a monkey has taken is not protectable under copyright. We also don't protect AI-generated works under copyright right now. So how does this relate to the story that I told and where things are going with creativity and Tech Pro t-shirts? Well, this is a quote from Mark Zuckerberg, and he was asked why he wears the same t-shirt and the same pants and the same hoodie all the time. And he said, I'm in this really lucky position where I get to wake up every day and help serve more than a billion people. And I feel like I'm not doing my job if I spend any of my energy on things that are silly or frivolous about my life. Now, others have said this too. Barack Obama made the same statement. And it's something that we all practice. We all take things in and our outputs, we don't want to include those things that we consider are silly or frivolous. Everything we create and everything we put out there is biased in some way based on what we believe. And what's fabulous is that over a millennia, we've had all of this output from so many people globally. We have all of these works that represent all of these different biases, and I don't mean that in a necessarily negative way, that we can draw on and get other people's points of view. But what concerns me a little bit about the idea of silly and frivolous is that artificial intelligence itself is very resource intensive. It takes a lot of resources to create these databases and to tag these images or text or whatever it may be and feed it into a computer. And it takes a lot of resources and a specific kind of resources to create the algorithms. And that algorithm is created by a person who has their own bias. And so that bias gets fed into the algorithm or into the tag of the data, the beautiful cat. And so what an engineer or someone else thinks is silly and frivolous is actually going to become part of a program that is going to start creating work after work after work. And it's one thing when, you know, I'm creating a book. It took me 10 years to write it and edit and get illustrations. And maybe there's five or 6,000 other books that come out that year that all represent different people. But AI, what I created in 10 years, might be able to generate in an hour. And so what happens when we start seeing 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 books that come out? I am building things based on all of these things around me and all how I take it in and how I then put it out and the biases around it. But when you have algorithms doing that, there are a couple of issues that really come up. So first, that algorithm is being manufactured by an engineer, and engineers are incredibly creative people. But they also approach problems in a very specific way. And often it is about efficiency. What is the most elegant way to solve a problem? How do we strip it down and get there as soon as possible? I have a good friend who was really excited about an algorithm he was working on that would make it so when you walked into a shop, the stuff you're there for just appears. You don't have to deal with going through all the aisles and looking at all of the other junk. And he was really excited because it's efficient. But for me, I don't like that. I like wandering the aisles. 
things. I like finding things that I wouldn't normally buy, or it generates ideas for things that I would not normally be thinking about. Getting to the most efficient thing possible is not always the best answer. When you're talking about efficiency, and you've got algorithms that will be generating things like movie scripts, we risk getting to a point where an algorithm says, a lot of people like this type of movie, and so we're gonna just do a deeper and deeper dive into the world of Marvel or Star Wars, and we're not going to actually start generating these other types of things because they're not going to generate as much money, there won't be as many people that go to them. And we start slowly losing those things that make our public domain really unique. It's very broad, it's full of a lot of creativity and a lot of different perspectives. What is also very interesting is that these things in the end, as I say, are very resource intensive. And as a result, we know that there is going to be a need for us to figure out how do we compensate. Copyright protects things so that they can go into the public domain so we can all learn from them and build from them. It also gives compensation. But what happens if you're generating a million books a year, 50,000 books a year? You're flooding a market, and when things get flooded, prices often tend to come down, which is great for readers, not necessarily great for the authors. And if you're generating that much content, you're not going to, as a company, necessarily make as much money in the end. And so, how do we start recovering those resources? Well, that's where I worry that we start looking at the data, the underlying data itself, the facts, the things that we have not traditionally protected. We all are generating data and <coughs> providing it in ways that we don't even realize. It's data that we did not traditionally look at in the same way. If I wear a wearable on my wrist and my phone in my pocket, I've got devices in my house, my car, work. As I'm driving, that device might be giving me a map, but it also may be tracking how fast I'm driving, when I turn, how quickly I turn, how I press the gas. And all of that data is going to help inform these algorithms for driverless cars, for example. And who should own and who should be able to monetize that data? And that's a big concern. There's a recent case out of China where somebody brought a copyright claim over an AI-generated work, and the Chinese court said, copyright law does not protect non-human created works. However, we recognize a lot of resources went into the data collection and the algorithm generation, and so there needs to be a way for this to be protected. But they wouldn't say what it was. Now, why am I bringing all this up and, and how does this relate to my story? Well, I'm here not as somebody who's worked for sort of past, present, future companies or as a lawyer or any of those things. I'm here as a creator. Artificial intelligence is trying to mimic human intelligence. It's trying to get to a point where we can't tell the difference. If we're being informed by this amazing amount of creative work out there that comes from a variety of people, don't we want the same for the artificial intelligence? Don't we want to encourage that data to be available so that others can create algorithms that might make competing works or better works or new works, things that we don't know of? Now, this is all still several decades off for this real, you know, it will be generating this many works, but we, we know they are starting to do it. And this is the exact time that we need to start having these discussions. It's very hard for people to understand the technology then to understand how it will impact them, and then to get regulators to implement laws that reflect all of those things. And so now is the time that we need to sit down and make sure that however this goes, we're protecting those very things that we've always wanted to protect, which is the public domain and the ability to have access. Thank you.